so weird. All right, people are coming in. A lot of familiar names. Welcome, uh, all RC Missouri members and guests. My name is Stacy Davidson, and I'm the president of RC Missouri. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today. RC Missouri is the newest chapter of the American Research Center in Egypt. Our mission is to celebrate and share the culture and history of Egypt from the ancient through the Islamic periods with Missouri and its neighboring communities. We're pleased that our virtual events are able to expand our programming beyond those geographic areas, and we welcome our national and international attendees to this event. RC Missouri's mission is outreach and education. We schedule presenters and topics which are accessible, interesting, and fun for all audiences. We also strive to provide a community in which institutions, professionals in the field, and non-professionals of all ages can share their knowledge, interest, and love for Egypt. You can stay up to date with RC Missouri news and events by following us on Facebook, Twitter, or by accessing our website at www.rcmo.org. Although both RC National and RC Missouri provide free public outreach events, such as this one, some lectures, workshops, and benefits are restricted to RC members. If you enjoy RC Missouri programming and would like to be more involved, please consider a membership and select Kansas City, Missouri to affiliate with our chapter. Today's presentation is Infinite Canvases Beyond the Sequential, and our guest speaker is Dr. Jennifer Miyuki Babcock. She earned her PhD at the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, and is now a visiting assistant professor in the Department of History of Art and Design at Pratt Institute, while also teaching at New York University, the New School, and the Fashion Institute of Technology. Prior to teaching, Dr. Babcock was a postdoctoral curatorial associate at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World and held research and fellowship positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Brooklyn Museum. From 2007 to 2008, she was a curator at the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art in New York City, where she organized and developed the first exhibition in the world about the art of digital and online comics. Dr. Babcock is finishing her first book, Tree Climbing Hippos and Ennobled Mice, Animal Fables in Ancient Egypt, which examines ancient Egyptian visual narrative construction and conceptions of aesthetics. Her publication also investigates how images of anthropomorphized animals are linked to oral folklore and religious practices. Faculty development grants and awards from the New School and the Fashion Institute of Technology have supported her publications and research interests. Please use the Q&A function to ask Dr. Babcock your questions. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. I would like to thank RC Missouri board member, Dr. Kate Shepard for hosting the event and Missouri s and for their webinar sponsorship. Without further ado, let's extend a warm RC Missouri welcome to Dr. Babcock. Thank you so much for that introduction, Stacy. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna just start sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Okay, so I would like to thank um, RC Missouri for the opportunity to share a topic of interest that I first explored in my graduate career. I'm returning to this topic this year because more and more people are becoming interested 
and what the study of comic arts can tell us about ancient narrative construction and vice versa. And also because I'm interested in how we could use comics to teach ancient Egyptian art. Uh, so this title slide is a mashup of two images from what seems to be virtually opposite ends of the art historical spectrum. We have an ancient Egyptian tomb and a comic book. The Egyptian image is from Rekmi Ray's tomb dating to the 18th dynasty or around um, 1400 BCE. The comic character seen here is a cartoon version of Scott McCloud, author of Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art, which was published in 1993. Today, I'll be exploring the extent to which Egyptian art is like comics and how both comic art and Egyptian art break away from the structure of sequential art, which McLeod defines as juxtaposed, pictorial, and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. This quote is from Understanding Comics, which primarily explores the formal aspects of comic art and establishes its vocabulary, which has been widely adopted by many cartoonists as well as comic scholars. One of the most notable things that McLeod did in his book was trace the history of comics back to not only early modern Europe and the widespread use of mechanical printing, but much further back to ancient times. The detail of understanding comics that we see here is when Scott McLeod explains how ancient Egyptian tomb paintings are essentially proto-comics. So before we even talk about what a comic is, I want to point out that how comics are perceived is rooted in our cultural upbringing. In Europe and Japan, comics are seen as serious, artistic, and cultural productions. In the United States, however, comics have been for a very long time considered a lowbrow medium, as McLeod puts it, cheap, disposable, kiddie fare. Today, I'm not going to go into the high-low art debate, but I need to acknowledge that this is a prejudice against comics that exists for many people. It's probably one of the reasons I imagine why McLeod traces the origins of comics back so far in our human history. It's almost like a reflexive defense and a way for him to say, see, Comics is art with a capital A and is part of the art historical canon. When McLeod wrote this book, there was almost no academic discourse about comics in the United States. So to be able to trace the history of comics back to ancient cultures whose objects and images are placed in art history survey texts and encyclopedic museums around the world would help legitimize comics in American academia and American culture in general. I first read Understanding Comics in the mid 2000s when I was starting my graduate career in ancient Egyptian art history at NYU and volunteering as a curator at the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art, which is now part of the Society of Illustrators. So as you can imagine, I had a lot of feelings when I read the summarization about comics throughout history. And I loved and love many of the things that McLeod has to say in this book, which has been so important to the study of comics history and understanding comics as an art form. And I was thrilled after reading it because I had many colleagues in graduate school who were in the camp of not seeing comics as art. I mean, this is the lobby in the lecture hall of my department. It's a Gilded Age mansion in the Upper East Side of Manhattan in New York City. It's called the Institute of Fine Arts. All of this is clearly a nod to old world academic institutions that only see architecture, sculpture, and painting as art with a capital A. So I wanted to share this book with many of my colleagues and many of my professors so that they could also see that comics have a long rich history and that comics is art and not necessarily one that is married to low cost print media, which is one of the reasons why it's been given such a low status in the United States. But with that said, 
as an art historian and as an Egyptologist, I've always had a little bit of a problem with this section of McLeod's book. So McLeod explains that he had struggled to find examples of juxtaposed pictorial images in deliberate sequence or sequential art as coined by Will Eisner in 1985 when he was looking at ancient Egyptian culture. He was studying Egyptian painting and art books and only saw motifs that were grouped by subject. There was no, nothing he could see that indicated any concern was showing a sequence of events. But soon he discovered that the Egyptian images that he had been looking at were decontextualized and incomplete. They were details of a much larger tableau. When he finally saw the larger context of Mena's tomb wall, he found the sequential narrative images he was looking for. Here we see McLeod on a black and white drawing of a series of agricultural scenes from a tomb belonging to a new, new kingdom high official named Mena. On this page, he explains how the images in Mena's tomb are ordered differently from how most comic panels are laid out on a page. Instead of reading from up to down and left to right, you would read Mena's tomb images in a zigzag pattern from bottom to top. McLeod's observation here is astute and a reminder that how we read and experience images often has cultural foundations. For instance, in the United States, we read comics from left to right, then top to bottom. But in Japan, people read comics from top to bottom and then right to left. The reason for this is because traditionally comics have their panels organized parallel to the direction of whatever writing system is being used. Because our eyes are moving a specific way to read the text, it's natural that our eyes would follow the images in that direction too. So one really cool thing about Egyptian text though is that you can read it in multiple directions, which means that the Egyptian way of looking at images and text is theoretically much more fluid than our own. This is something that McLeod didn't take into account when he was looking at Egyptian art. Also, the section of Mena's tomb is the only decorative program from Egypt that he seemed to have examined. And it's one that doesn't actually have any hieroglyphic inscriptions, by the way. Um, and it's for these reasons that he presents the vectorality or the direction of reading in Mena's tomb as if it is the way all Egyptian visual narratives are structured. However, this is not the case. Valérie Angenot, who grace, graciously shared this slide and some of her research with me, has demonstrated a number of directions that tombs are intended to be read. And many of these directions are counterintuitive to how we would move our eyes from motif to motif. For me, the most strikingly different reading patterns are the spiral, the figure eight, the double inverted and superpose Z. And we also have some reading patterns that um, are organized as a restrophodon, which is when the direction of the writing or images is reversed on alternate lines. Angino is interested in the anthropology of gaze and perception, what she calls the Egyptian period eye. But as she has noted, and as I have experienced too, recognizing the reading pattern or vectorality in which an Egyptian would track a narrative on a wall can be difficult. Sometimes it's unclear what the chronological and spatial layout of images are supposed to be. But with agricultural scenes, such as what we see in Mena's tomb, the order of images is much more obvious because the order of planting and sowing and harvesting is more or less universal. So by tracing the arrangement of agricultural scenes and a variety of tombs is how Angino has shown the ways, the different ways that Egyptians represent the passing of chronological time in these different layouts. Anthony Spallinger in his book, Icons of Power, focuses on the simultaneous, sequential and iconic narrative nature of New Kingdom military images. He interprets the large image of the king to be an iconic moment arrested from the rest of the wall. 
So the entire relief illustrates two separate yet interconnected narratives at once. In other words, the iconic motif of the triumphant king may be understood as being framed within the larger historical battle, which is depicted sequentially. And yes, an entire narrative can be encapsulated in a single image or a single motif. This is sometimes called a monocenic narrative, where we have an entire sequence of, of events abbreviated into a single scene. Gabala Ali Gabala also calls images like this a culminating scene or an image that essentially represents the climax of the story. One who is familiar with the story's iconography should be able to recognize um, that the iconic motif represents a pivotal moment within a larger narrative. So for an Egyptian, this image of the king would be understood as the moment of the enemy's defeat and Egypt's victory. The king's triumph is highlighted through the motif's sheer size and would be the first thing most people would look at when reading the overall narrative structure on the wall. Now the structure of print comics, which is so often defined by its collaboration of image and text, is often restricted and controlled by the structure of the written language that accompanies the images. This is true even in silent comics, where messages and ideas rely only on visual sequences. But we see that in comics, the format is so ingrained that panels also move away and that matches our textual reading habits, even when text is not there. But pictures without words generally allow for incredible flexibility and vectorality or the directions in which we read an image or series of images. So in her study of vectoralities and art and tracking how the eye moves when someone looks at art, Angino pointed out the meandering narrative that Memling designed in his painting of the Christ Passion. The viewer starts reading the canvas from the left side and the narrative ultimately ends on the right side, mimicking how we would read a page. But within the canvas, the narrative journey moves up and down and also at one point doubles back. It's a confusing path, but is intended, I imagine, to evoke the windy streets of Jerusalem where the passion took place. But the only way to really know which group of people to focus on next, if you were to read this image, is if you were to know the story and the order of the passion beforehand. Here is another example of a nonlinear narrative story um, that's told in a different Renaissance painting. This is Masaccio's Tribute Money. The viewer's gaze immediately goes to the center of the fresco panel because Masaccio uses linear perspective to bring our attention to the vanishing point of the painting, which is at Christ's head. The center of the fresco is also the beginning of the narrative. We look at Christ, who is pointing towards the left part of the scene. The man standing directly next to him, um, St. Peter, mimics this gesture. And so the viewer's eye is then led to the left part of the scene, which is the subsequent part of the narrative, St. Peter removing money from a fish's mouth. The only part of the scene remaining is at the far right, where Peter pays the tax collector with the money he retrieved from the opposite side of the panel. So even though the story's events are not occurring from left to right in a sequential order, the narrative logic is nonetheless maintained through compositional devices that direct the viewer's gaze. Unlike Memling's representation of the passion, you do not necessarily need to be familiar with the story of the tribute money to figure out the sequence of events. Egyptian art also uses compositional and formal devices to help direct the viewer's experience of an image. We saw how size can be used to highlight a narrative within a narrative. Formal decisions such as the use of or lack of registers can also help convey specific moods and ideas. Uh, so note the difference in how we experience the orderly row of domestic animals 
compared to the wild realm of the desert, which is pictured on the right. Sometimes it can be difficult to know what these formal decisions are trying to convey because the way Egyptians represented their three dimensional world in two dimensions is very different from the mimetic naturalistic modes of representations that most modern viewers are used to. Note, for example, how difficult it is to interpret architectural spaces in this two dimensional representation. To the untrained eye, it is unclear where the courtyards are, where the doorways and entrances are, and it is impossible to see how tall the structure is supposed to be. So we have to be careful about how we conceptualize what the Egyptians may be trying to convey visually about space and also time. On some tomb walls and temple walls, there is nothing within the motifs that necessarily refers to the passage of time. I think we assume we are experiencing a passage of time because we often read images and registers of images, like how we read comics. But why do we assume that this is what the Egyptians intended to convey? Perhaps what happens on the far left of a register could also be happening at the same time as what is being depicted on the far right of a register. One could also read the topmost register of a line of offering bearers as seen here, walking in unison with a line of offering bearers depicted in the bottommost register of a relief. When we look at desert scenes on tomb walls, such as the one that's in my title slide, I also can't help but wonder if we are intended to see this as a representation of the passage of time, where we read register to register, or if we're meant to see this instead as a vast landscape where the fauna is running around us all at once. Something like this could function in a somewhat similar way, I think, to a splash page in a comic, which are used to establish a setting or a mood and not necessarily used to represent the passing of time. Of course, there's another dimension of narrative in a lot of Egyptian art that I have not addressed yet, which is the third dimension, or rather how these narratives work in architectural space. While McLeod eventually discovered the larger context of the section of Mena's tomb, the agricultural um, representation, he neglected to consider how this wall works with other walls and chambers of the tomb. This is something that I had pointed out in a paper I presented at the International Comics Art Forum and in an article that I wrote for the International Journal of Cartoon Studies in 2011. In that article and also in my presentation, I was mainly concerned with the fact that McLeod doesn't address the cultural context and function of Mena's tomb wall. The focus of the article and the presentation was the magical function of Egyptian tombs. And my primary point was that because narrative was not necessarily the primary reason for the imagery, that would be inaccurate to call them comics. I explained how a butchering scene in a tomb implies the active role of priests in which figures are depicted engaged in butchering oxen and collecting pieces for offering. The overall effect of such a scene was to activate the role of priests in the initial phase of the tomb owner's journey and not simply representing a sequence of time. I described how other scenes like fishing and fowling scenes were intended to be magically protective, endowing the deceased with the ability to control his or her environment and uphold ma'at or truth, necessary elements for ensuring a successful rebirth. The images I stressed were not simply to represent a sequence of time or events, which was what McLeod's primary focus was in demonstrating that ancient comics exist. 10 years later, I would like to provide an addendum to what I wrote in that article and to what I presented at that conference. While it's true that tomb chapels like Mena's were intended for the benefit of the deceased, clearly they function to communicate ideas to an audience 
one of the basic definitions of comics. Further, the images not only impart information, they are designed to impress and entertain visitors to the tomb chapel, perhaps as a way to encourage them to leave offerings. This is something that my colleague Steve Harvey stressed when he gave a different talk about McLeod's take on ancient Egyptian art at an RC New York meeting a few years ago. People were encouraged to visit these tombs, at least the tomb chapels, and they would marvel at the beauty of the paintings and reliefs. The experience of the tomb visitor is perhaps just as important as to however the images may have aided the deceased. But McLeod still doesn't sufficiently explain how the visitor experiences the tomb chapel and understanding comics. I imagine that if McLeod had access to an actual Egyptian tomb, he would have discussed the narrative differently, not only as it is seen on this one wall on Mena's tomb, but how it unfolds and relates to the other walls of the tomb chapel. In the early 90s, when McLeod was researching material for understanding comics, this would have been difficult to do. Thankfully, technology today has made this easier, and you can actually take a virtual visit to Mena's tomb thanks to Arcee's efforts. This virtual platform where you can walk through and admire Mena's tomb chapel was released just last year. It's an invaluable tool for the public. And as an educator, I use this tomb and other tomb tours a lot so that my students can better understand the scale of these spaces and how the images within these spaces are arranged. So to quickly recap what we've gone over so far, we've talked about how comics tend to be organized sequentially, how the arrangement of panels within a comic parallel the writing system that is being used in the comic. Um, I, I mentioned briefly like how the structure of a comic is inherently linked to writing. And so the devices that we see in comics, borders, gutters, panels, and speech bubbles, those are all have been developed because of the printing industry. I have shown how Egyptian art isn't restricted to this linear mode of juxtaposition because of the fluidity of how the text is read, because of the fluidity that images allow in general, and because a lot of narratives are intended to be experienced in three-dimensional space. You might argue then that what makes a comic a comic is the fact that they are sequential images printed on portable material. However, comics do not always have to be in print. And because they don't have to be in print, the format and conventions of comic art can be more fluid and we can break away from sequential narrative organization. In 2000, McLeod wrote the sequel to Understanding Comics, which was called Reinventing Comics, How Imagination and Technology Are Revolutionizing an Art Form. In this book, he refreshes the reader of all the basics of understanding comics, but he spends a lot of time discussing the future of comics. He talks about the comics market, how to keep comics alive, how to make comics and the comics industry more diverse, and how comics can use new technology to push itself as a medium. While reinventing comics is to some extent outdated, which is something that McLeod himself predicted would happen due to how rapidly technology advances, it records a very pivotal moment in comics history, the birth of the webcomic. McLeod talks about webcomics as a way to revitalize the comics industry. One thing that he believed correctly is that webcomics would allow for more inclusivity and a greater diversity of voices. Anyone with an internet connection can create a webcomic, which means that with webcomics, we have more diverse artists and authors. You also have webcomics that are directed at very specific niche audiences audiences that would not necessarily be reached in print since print comics often aim for mass appeal. So for instance, we have numerous comics dedicated solely to video gaming culture. We have comics aimed towards history nerds, so perhaps appealing to many of us here. 
Um, and also one or some that are aimed for PhD students um, and also people involved in academia. Another one I'm sure um, would appeal to many people here today. So when web comics started, it was essentially a whole indie scene, but one that was more accessible and more diverse than ever before. So many web comics follow a traditional format which emulate what we see in print. Some mimic the look of comic books, but a good number of them follow the format of a traditional three or four panel newspaper print comic. I always thought that this was interesting because the newspaper comic in its most modern iteration has been criticized for its abbreviated tiny format. Early newspaper cartoons such as Little Nemo used to take an entire page, bringing the reader in with its detailed artistry and color. Over time, comics shrunk in size and became simpler in composition to allow syndicates to sell more features and for newspapers to squeeze more comics in to tempt new subscribers. With digital art though, there is no need for this. McLeod advocated that artists take fuller advantage of digital media in the final chapter of Reinventing Comics, which he entitled The Infinite Canvas Digital Comics. In this chapter, McLeod discusses the limitations of the traditional canvas of comics, the page. He explains how, at least at the time of his writing, which would be in the late 90s, that the computer monitor had been used as a page rather than as a potentially unending papyrus scroll, a window, or as he calls it, an infinite canvas. So with a monitor, comics, as he puts it, can be released from the box and creators can stretch their limbs. He presents different possibilities that a creator can explore with this new medium. He proposes that in a digital environment, there's no reason a 500 panel story can't be told vertically or horizontally like a great graphic skyline. You can read one of these infinite com canvas comics on the cloud's own website. Most famously, we have my obsession with chess, which is um, a narrative that you read by scrolling downwards. So here, the cloud uses a papyrus scroll like format rather than a codex, a codex or a book format where you would, um, and in a codex format, you would click an arrow or a button that says next to reach the following virtual page. So he really designed this comic to take full advantage of the digital medium. That said though, Xerox offered to print a physical copy of this comic. And I was lucky enough to have um, this on display when I curated the exhibit, Infinite Canvas, The Art of Web Comics at MoCA. So unfortunately, um, I don't, and, and neither do any of my, my colleagues from MoCA apparently have any photographs of this installation, but we had to get very creative as, as you can maybe imagine how to display it. Um, so if memory serves me correctly, we use something similar to curtain rods to mount the top and the bottom of the scroll. And we showed sections of the comic at a time uh, because in print, my obsession with chess ends up being about 16 feet long. In reinventing comics, McCloud represents a variety of other formats that a digital comic could adopt, which would otherwise be unwieldy in print. So he says that we could indulge our left to write up down reading habits, um, but organize them instead as a giant descending staircase, or we could pack it all away into a slowly revolving cube. He also explains how many of the visual elements that had become associated with print comics can also change. So the four-sided panel could take other forms. And so he was literally thinking outside of the box here and also outside of the flatness of the printed page. He recognized the internet's ability to connect the panels of comics through a matrix of narrative choices, allowing for fluid narratives that can branch out like a tree or a web. So one of the greatest potentials of the infinite canvas is to break away from linear sequential narratives. And though McLeod may not have necessarily realized it, the infinite canvas meant creating a comic narrative as akin to how one can experience the paintings in an Egyptian tomb. 
even if a specific linear structure was designed on a particular wall or a series of wall, walls, when you're in a tomb, you are of course free to walk from wall to wall, counterclockwise or clockwise, or you can break away and move dynamically around the space. The hyperlinking of a digital comic which you, would allow you to do this as well. Though McLeod returns to ex his examination of Mena's tomb and reinventing comics, he still doesn't explore beyond this wall. He describes the motifs within the wall as a sequence of images in a sequential line, functioning as a temporal map, one of the basic tenets of narrative art. As he puts it, the longer the time, the longer the line. But McLeod's understanding of the use of narrative in Mena's tomb is limited. While the zigzag narrative moving from bottom to up is seen on that part of the wall, he doesn't take into account even the rest of the wall, or of course, how the wall relates to the rest of the tomb's decoration. So he only sees a section of Mena's agricultural wall, and he also only sees it as a flat space. He doesn't consider how Mena's tomb was already using the infinite canvas structure that he had imagined for digital comics. To help illustrate my point, I'm going to compare a digital comic that allows the reader to explore an architectural space and an Egyptian tomb. In this webcomic, you explore the narrative and the physical space of the comic, similar to a side-scrolling adventure game. When you study the structure of the comic, you see that the panels are arranged to look like a cross-section of a building plan. This type of panel composition while possible on paper, would be much more unwieldy and not as effective a medium for the storytelling experience. Because it's a digital comic, you have greater navigational freedom, allowing you to move backwards into the comic and to go back to spaces and panels that you've already visited. To me, this comic is not that dissimilar to understanding how the architectural structure and imagery is designed and organized in many tombs. And I'm gonna take a look at the, one of the royal tombs of the Valley of the Kings. So the royal tombs are not intended for visitors as is the case for the private tomb chapels of non-royal Egyptians like Mena, but they are nonetheless designed with an experiential narrative and a journey in mind. The location of certain motifs corresponds with an understanding of geographical space. The ceiling is painted as a sky. And as you walk further into the tomb, you also descend downwards towards the burial chamber, towards the netherworld that's described in the Book of the Dead. And when we look at plans of a typical New Kingdom tomb from the Valley of the Kings, we see that it looks similar to the layout of the webcomic I just showed you. The, the difference is that instead of being a side scrolling experience, it's a three-dimensional first-person narrative journey, a journey through a microcosm representing the netherworld and the sun cycle. I want to point out Moses III's burial chamber, which is decorated to represent a small two-dimensional artifact. The decoration within this burial chamber is quite different from what we see in other painted tombs during this period in Egyptian history. The text is not written in traditional hieroglyphs, but rather a cursive form of hieroglyphs called hieratic. The images are not fully formed figures, but instead stick figures. And overall, the color palette is rather limited. Instead of having a technicolor experience, we have a buff neutral colored wall with black figures and red highlights. The reason for these aesthetic choices is that Moses III's wall is supposed to emulate papyrus painting. Note that the walls of the burial chamber do not have sharp edges. Instead, we see the walls are rounded. The overall shape of the burial chamber makes it look as if we have a larger than life Book of the Dead papyrus scroll wrapping around and protecting the king. If we imagine the papyrus unfurling around the sarcophagus, we can also imagine that the experience of reading the tomb is also sequential. However, this is not the case. 
the fourth and fifth hours of the um, duat, um, the another world basically, do not follow in consecutive order. Winifred Barta explained that it's likely that this was done to create a spiraling narrative. So to Moses III's burial chamber illustrates and allows the visitor to potentially experience two simultaneous Egyptian conceptualizations of time. On the one hand, the sequential representation of time is maintained as you follow the different representations of the hours of the night from section to section. But the sequential timeline is only maintained if you physically cross the tomb. By crossing the tomb and continuing your journey to the different hours of the night, you create a different narrative experience for your body. Rather than experience time as a straight line, you move as a spiral in space. Um, so for an Egyptian, the sequence of images and the movement of your body would be a combination of the conception of cyclical time, the daily repetition of the solar cycle and the process of death and rebirth, as well as linear time, which only moves in one direction. Thus, we see the Egyptians were quite adept at representing non-linear narratives, probably because culturally they were embracing the concept of two different types of time existing at once. Jan Osman has noted this type of narrative flexibility in his discussion of mythological constellations consisting of icons, which is a tableau-like presentation of religious conceptions. So these mythical icons are loosely connected through characters and actions, um, and is the reason why he feels there's little narrative coherence in ancient Egyptian mythology. For instance, when you read the myth, the contendings of Horus and Seth, we see a separation of motifs and divisions into two mythic cycles that can coexist um, and at times contradict one another. So in one myth, you can have Horus who, um, or in both myths, you, you have Horus who loses his eye according to a central narrative episode. Um, and in one version, you may, uh, he may be the one presenting the eye of Horus, but in a different version, he may be the one receiving the eye of Horus. But neither of these versions would necessarily con contradict the other. Um, both of these stories would be accepted as explaining the ancient Egyptian cosmological worldview. So this is probably why in Egyptian iconography, there can be a number of ways that events or phenomena can be depicted. So for instance, the sun's path can be represented as a disc passing through the body of the sky goddess Newt, which is what we see at the top image here, um, or it can be represented as the sun god Ra riding the solar bark, which I'm showing you here at the bottom of the screen. We see also the flexibility of the arrangement of motifs in Egyptian tombs as well. Ankh-Mahor and Abba's tombs are particularly good examples of how this flexibility is allowed and sometimes required in the design and layout of various decorative motifs. So while a larger tomb such as Ankh Mahor's, um, which I'm showing you on the left, a very schematic plan, you, have, you could have multiple rooms dedicated just to the act of butchering cattle. But for Abba's tomb, you would have to abbreviate these scenes because they have to be confined to a small section of the wall. So you can abbreviate the scenes by um, omitting narrative details in a sequence or by encapsulating an entire narrative as an iconic image. And then essentially the viewer would be um, responsible for filling in the blanks. So what is going to be happening um, from motif to motif. This mutable way of telling stories in which you can swap out narrative motifs and details is foreign from most modern storytelling traditions and foreign from what we see in most comic narratives, which are typically much more straightforward. But when we explore the possibilities of the infinite canvas, we can also imagine opportunities um, for more fluid narrative constructions. So, so far I've brought up large scale, expensive works of Egyptian art in our, in our discussion, but I would like to also show a small scale, yet just as sophisticated an example, topic of, of my book, by the way. So these are um, 
On the bottom of the image, I'm showing you figure ostraca, which are limestone flakes with drawings um, that depict anthropomorphized animals. So visually, they obviously look like many modern day cartoon characters, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. And so you could see why material like this would be in a talk related to ancient comics. Um, but the subject matter is actually besides the point. Um, I'm highlighting these ostraca because they also demonstrate um, how they can invite narrative fluidity and also spontaneity. So in addition to these um, ostraca, we also have papyri with um, the subject matter. And the papyri do suggest a specific sequence of events um, where each motif may represent possibly a monoscenic narrative. But I also argue that the sequence in um, which these images could be placed, if you were to tell the story with Ostraca, is open-ended and allows someone to arrange and rearrange motifs in order to form new narratives. So it's essentially applying Osman's theory about mythical constellations to these objects, if we think about each one of these being like an icon. So as far as I'm aware, McLeod did not know about these ostraca or their narrative potential when he developed Five Card Nancy, which is a printed comic that plays with narrative order. Now, some may not consider this a comic, but rather a game, but I wanna bring our attention to it because it demonstrates the narrative fluidity that I imagine for the ostraca. So according to the rules, which you can find on McLeod's website, you start with cut up panels of old Nancy comic strips. Each player is given five random panels from the deck. The game starts when one player lays down a card, which becomes panel one. Each player then picks a card from their hand, which they think would make a good next panel. And then votes are cast to see if the panel stays. If the panel is rejected, then you're supposed to take your panel back. Um, the game ends when one player has gotten rid of all of their cards. Judging in this game is purely subjective and the game is structured to allow for many narrative possibilities, um, which is interesting because all of the individual panels come from a source that did have a specific sequential order at one point. My friend and colleague from MOCA, Ken Wong, also started playing with tangible non-digital ways to develop narratives that break away from sequential order. During the web comics exhibition opening at MOCA, there was a lot of discussion about the comparative merits of web comics versus printed comics. Many of the attendees at the opening were the feeling that anything printed comics can do, web comics can do better. But as is the case with many people, um, Ken was drawn to the physical. And so he set out to design a comic that one had to interact with as a tangible three-dimensional object, one that was impossible to fully duplicate on screen. So a few months later, Ken debuted the first of his origami comics, Pandora's Box. It's a comic in the shape of a paper box, which is folded from a single sheet of paper. We see a story told on the outside faces of the box, but the climactic moment is inside the box. So it forces the reader to open the box at the moment in the story when that action is loaded with great significance. Since then, Ken has designed a number of other types of origami comics, all of which are composed of different shapes that are related to the theme that is being told within these folds. And if you're interested in learning more about Ken's work, you can visit his web website, um, origamicomics.com. But even with these efforts to push print comics into new realms, more and more comics are being produced digitally and are being consumed digitally. These digital comics are also being read in ways that McLeod probably couldn't even imagine when he sat down and wrote Reinventing Comics. So we see comics being read a lot through phones and tablets, for instance. Um, but even though the screen is smaller than McLeod imagined in 2000, people are using it as a scrolling device or as a window. And so as a result, we see digital comics 
taking much longer and larger formats, which is what he predicted or what he wanted. Um, and, and by longer and larger, I mean this both visually and also narratively. And there have been a number of apps that have been developed to make reading comics digitally accessible and easy. So just as the mecha uh, mechanization of print revolutionized narrative art, which allowed for new visual, visual conventions and language to develop into the thing that we call comics today, digital technology is also reinventing the art form. Artists are stretching their limbs. And with new technologies, we need to think a bit again about how we understand comics and how we can make comics reach its fullest potential. What I hope I have demonstrated today is that many of the things that digital comics are doing is not too dissimilar to what Egyptian art did thousands of years ago. And while I'm not necessarily describing the narrative art of ancient Egypt as comics per se, it is striking how similar the two art forms, um, what the two art forms have in common. While McLeod started this discussion and recognizing that Egyptian art shows deliberately juxtaposed images whose purpose is to tell a story or narrative, there is clearly much more to explore. Perhaps in using some of the language of comic studies, especially as comics become much more narratively fluid, we can think of new ways to think about and talk about ancient Egyptian narratives and their construction. Also, perhaps there are ways that educators and museums can use comics, whether they be physical or digital, to better contextualize the looking experience of an ancient Egyptian for the purpose of educating the public. Until virtual reality becomes more accessible and easy to use, comics in traditional or digital formats may be the best way of demonstrating how Egyptian narratives were structured. Even when the content and purpose of Egyptian art is different from comic art, the language that's being used is so similar that to ignore this connection and the possibilities behind these connections would be a missed opportunity. So I'd like to thank you again for your attention. And I would also like to um, have special thanks to my colleague, Valérie Angeneau, who is at the University, Université de Québec à Montréal, um, and Matt Murray, who is the former director of MOCA who um, helped me with some of the discussion of comics um, and also former um, volunteers, my fellow former volunteers at MOCA who um, helped me out as well. So thank you very much. And if you have, um, if you need to reach out to me at all, you can see my emails up there too. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got, uh, for those of you who have questions, you can go down to the Q&A uh, down at the bottom of your screen and type something in. Um, we have one from Ann Austin. Um, would you like me, um, Dr. Babcock, Babcock, I apologize. Would you like me to, um, to do the Q&A to mediate or do you want to? Oh, um, I, you know what? You've you done enough. I, I will. I will read the questions for you. All I right. Okay, here we go. Um, from Ann Austin, how do you see Egyptian concepts of time as more than just linear influence, as more than just linear, influencing the layout of Egyptian tomb scenes? Um, so this is a great um, question. So it's something that, um, you know, I think about it in, in terms of like how it relates to their idea of religion, obviously, and for, I guess, um, you know, maybe them thinking about their day to days, but um, lives, like how do you think about, like how do they conceptualize their own life that they live day to day that seems to be going forward? And then, you know, thinking about how that um, is connected to their ideas of rebirth. Um, so I, I do think it's something that maybe they were, you know, conscious of and thinking about. Um, I, it's not something that I think a lot of, um, um, people in, in American or European cultures really consider as time seems to just primarily move, move forward. Um, but yeah, I, I am interested in that conception as well. I would like to read more um, literature about that and I, I should probably become more acquainted with 
um, some of the religious texts. I'm not a philologist. I'm mainly concerned with how it's how it's manifested on the walls. Um, and and I, I think also this idea of time when we see it represented, um, you know, on the wall. I, I don't even think we necessarily have to see it as it moves through an entire space, but even on like a singular wall itself, you know, something that um, Valérie Angenot pointed out, you know, you have those spiral patterns that you sometimes see within the wall, which I thought was really interesting. And, and it'd be interesting to explore, you know, when somebody decides what kind of compositional format they're going to use, like yeah. zigzag or spiral. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, Valérie Angenot says, thank you for an amazing talk, Jennifer, which I agree. Thank you. <laughs> not so much that was more a comment than a question but i had to read it out because it's absolutely important um and then cs says thanks for a stimulating talk what is the reference for osman's discussion of mythical constellations uh great question and i am forgetting the specific source off the top of my head um but i have it in my one of my books bibliographies um, you know, if, if you give me a minute to search for that, I can probably find it. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> so Julia. Search, search for, for God, God in, ancient Egypt. in ancient Egypt. That's um, what I was thinking too, but I wasn't totally positive. So if you check that book, you can um, read more about his discussion of that, which is, I think, um, you know, um, a really interesting way to think about a lot of things in Egyptian culture. Like he also talks about the multiplicity of approaches um, um, and the fact, you know, why these contradictory ideas exist or what seems to us contradictory, but to an Egyptian, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, what other questions do we have? Stacy, do you have any questions? I'm gonna put you on the spot. I have a lot of questions. But, um, <laughs> oh, wait, uh, sorry. Oh, here we go. Julia I'm just typed ahead. in a long one and then I'm gonna come back to you. Okay, uh, Julia says uh, a long one. I always thought of ancient Egyptian mythic constellations as similar to early fables, fairy tales and shared folklore. The broad strokes of the story are consistent but there could be many more different paths through the larger constellation of stories. That is mainly before many were codified and written down and became popular as Grimm's fables, etc. Um, I wonder if this notion of linear narrative is just grossly modern in its construction and fails then to realize the fluidity of the first 99% of human history. Thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, that's a really great point. And I often, and one of the things that I talk about in some of my uh, research and, and in the book is, is how this idea of narrative um, and this idea that things have to come in a sequence is a very modern way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think a lot of that might have to do with the structure of, of modern books and how we read it. And also, I, I mean, I, not to say that it did not, you know, we didn't have these linear things, but when you look at most early stories, it's usually these frame narratives where you have a larger story and stories nested within that story and the elements within the story can be um, moved around. So basically, you know, what Julia is, is talking about and um, something that I think is definitely true for, you know, fables. Um, so I do, I, I agree that yes, linear, the idea of linear narrative was, um, is something very modern and not nearly as common um, in ancient, um, cultures. I mean, I think that's true even with other um, cultures outside of Egypt too. Yeah, I was wondering that too. It, it, it's like when, um, yeah, I mean, when we apply sort of modern ideas of objects onto ancient objects and we don't, yeah, we don't get the real idea. Um, and Julie says, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting and fantastic talk. Thank um, you. Stacy. I apologize for interrupting you. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, uh, I believe there are two more, so we can okay. do those first. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, Joseph Davidson asks, uh, graphic novel is sometimes used today to try and separate the narrative style and story from comics and those connotations. Did Egyptians have such a distinction? Um, what about papyri and its page and, I'm sorry, page and scroll format? 
Um, so that's an interesting question. I'm not really sure how I can, um, how to really, um, there's a lot, there's a lot there in this question. Yeah. So I also think that the idea about the graphic novel is another way to legitimize comics, like, you know, thinking of it more as literature. I think it's also, um, has something to do with this need to, um, to, um, make it look better, I guess, and to make it seem more academic. Um, you know, when you, I, I've, I've met lots of cartoonists, by the way, who, who hate that word, graphic, mm -hmm. graphic, and they find it pretentious. Um, but in any case, I don't know if they would necessarily have um, a distinction of like between like, you know, um, small form, short form narratives versus longer narratives. I don't know if it would be possible to figure out um, if, if they felt there was a difference because people, I, as far as I know, you know, um, during in ancient times, there wasn't a lot of people talking about liter literature and, and formatting and the way that we talk about it now. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for bringing that into my my headspace. <laughs> <laughs> um, Constance Margowski asks, uh, or she says, thank you for a wonderful talk. How refreshing it will be to apply the language for comic analysis to the analysis of Egyptian art. I'm going to editorialize. I agree. Um, question, did you happen to have ideas about retrograde writing that accompanies associated tomb or papyrus vignettes? Have you noticed any retrograde orientation of narrative sequence in visual materials? Um, so that's a great question. And, you know, it's something that I honestly need to, to look more into. I'm sure, um, I'm sure uh, Valerie Angino would probably have more to say about that. But, um, I mean, I think, you know, with the, the Bosphoral, uh, the Bosphor, how do you pronounce it? The Bosphoron, um, arrangement of, of sequences is sort of a reflection of that um, because with that you alternate the direction of images and text. Um, so, you know, it goes one way and then it moves back the other way. Um, I, I think it's really interesting in the, in the context of agricultural scenes too, because it's sort of similar to how you would work the land. I mean, that's where the word actually comes from. It's a Greek word meaning like, I forgot exactly, but like the cows moving and, and planting. Um, Oh. Um, yeah, anyway, fun, fun fact that I recently learned about too. <laughs> so it sort of got me thinking, oh, like, um, that was probably done to, to emulate like this physical actual action that we see, um, and, and how it's arranged that way. Um, but yeah, I think you can, um, you see, you can see a, a, a lots of things. We just have to sort of flex our minds to see it. I think that if we don't flex our minds, we'll be stuck in this tradition of, you know, wanting to see, like we see these Egyptian wall paintings and these registers that look like panels and, and we want to read them like comics. Um, and it's not necessarily like that. I mean, there's a lot, obviously, I believe that, that we can use a lot in what we understand from comics, but we also have to break away from it, which is one of the nice things um, about digital comics because it's going to give us these tools, I think. Yeah. Um, and that actually leads, uh, that idea that you're talking about leads really well into the next question that we have um, from CS. Uh, the discussion reminds me of linguist Robert Kaplan's famous Squiggles article in which he attempts to see different types of sequencing as culturally determined. Do you think these comics are cultural constructs um, and then just to conclude that, Kaplan actually goes on to say, people from different cultures think differently. Yeah, so I, I agree that um, it's definitely something that is rooted in a cultural construct. I'm not too familiar, by I, I, I'm not familiar with that article at all. Um, if you'd like to send that to me, I, I'd love it. Um, anybody who might have it, or you know, I can probably also find it too, <laughs> but um, with a, obviously with, um, um, COVID still libraries are closed. So it's a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like definitely, I mean, even with, and the, the other thing that's interesting about comics too, is that it's not even just a cultural thing, but it also has to do with, um, you know, the, the mechanism of making it like the idea that, 
you know, a comic artist, if they're working in a codex, codex format, they understand, all right, this is how we're going to begin the page. And the last panel has to look like this to be a literal page, like to be a page turner. So like, and this is something that McLeod talks about um, is how artists think about the book um, and the structure of the book and how they organize panels and so on. Yeah. I am looking for it, CS. I found a handout for it. Oh, here's the citation. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna put this in here. Copy in the chat. Great, so with all that extra time, I did think of a question. Um, and I think it might be a super basic question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, I'm thinking about the sequencing of Tutmosis of the Third's tomb that you showed. And I'm wondering, since it's not entirely obvious in these tomb scenes what the sequence is, or if that even matters what the sequence is, how was that particular sequence determined? Was it looking at other literary or religious writings and then saying, well, that one went in this order, so we're going to find those corresponding panels and then put the tomb in this order to be read? Or mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? It does make sense. That's an excellent question because um, lots of parts of the Book of the Dead, uh, you know, are formed with these constellations, right? The, the order doesn't matter. Um, but in the burial chamber, it's the hours of the night and mm -hmm. that has a strict order. Um, you know, um, it's not something that I can recall in my, in my mind's eye, like what it looks like specifically, but because that order, the, the hours of the night has a sequential sequence that you can't fiddle around with. So that, in that sense, mm -hmm. that's a really clear representation of linear time. So it's, it's interesting that though the way they've structured it is so that you have to actually walk across the room and it's even though it's you know it seems like to us i imagine like if we were to do that and if we were making a fancy tomb for ourselves and we want to do the hours of the night and we wanted to look like a big papyrus you would just walk around it and then you know that's would work for us but apparently it was also important to have that cyclical you know spirally motion as well great thank you mm -hmm. All right, last call for questions. We'll take one more. These have all been really great questions. Yeah, thank you. It gives me some more to think about too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seeing none, Stacy. All right, so we will uh, conclude with our final bit of information for today, which is that we will have another virtual event next week. So. Um, again, thank you very much, Dr. Babcock, for coming today. This was an excellent talk, um, and I can definitely tell that we enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. um, next month, uh, we have a, a special treat as well. We will have the curator of the Ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern Art uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Dr. Denise Doxey, giving us a presentation about this wonderful exhibit that is now in the St. Louis Art Museum. And her talk is entitled From the Nile to the Mississippi, Ancient Nubia at the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, so the person who put this exhibit together is going to be talking to us about it. So make sure to come and have all of your questions ready. And if you're close enough to make it to St. Louis and it's safe for you to do so, then by all means, don't miss this amazing opportunity to see this exhibit. Nope. Um, next, next month, it will be at 2 p.m. Central instead of our normal time. So just we'll, we'll make sure to note that in all of the um, information that we send out. So again, thank you very much, everyone, for coming um, and spending part of your Saturday with us. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good night. <laughs>